day zone is in a place to be. And as soon as we get this up and running, we're going to go. So finish your questions. My man, my mellow, my good brother. What's day zone. What's up, my man? Yo, thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah. Here man. live on Instagram. Is this? The, yeah, I feel like. My father or my grandfather or something, I'm trying to figure out. You want me to wear headphones? No, it's all good, man. I have mine, so, you know, I'm, I'm nice and clear. And thank you for everybody that joined in, that's, you know, tuning, tuning in. And, you know, feel free to send us your questions. Uh, Jay and I go back for the people that uh, don't know. We go back to quote your man, Prince Paul, like uh, scoliosis and hairlines. And, you know, judging by my hairline, it's really been... It's been a while, Jay and, Jay and I. Uh, my hairline noticed. is good, bro. My hairline. Your, is good. your hairline's good. Mine, you know, maybe it's getting there. But yo, welcome everyone uh, that's tuning in. So we're gonna talk about uh, your new album uh, with the Do Rights, a funky, yeah. a, a bad time. We're getting into a lot of other stuff again, folks. We know each other really well, so it's gonna go nice and deep. There's the cover art, um, and it's really you know well done. And, and Jay's part of a group with Pablo Martin. Again, they are called the Do Rights. And if you have any questions. Again, feel free to send us, uh, uh, you know, send them our way. So we're going to get right into it. Um, so, Jay, you got the new album. This is the fifth album uh, that you've had out under the uh, Do Rights. Why don't you tell listeners about, like, what kind of sound you were going for on the album? Well, um, our sound is kind of like we, we try not to, because um, with funk, there's so much emphasis on being authentic. I think with any genre, but with funk, you want to get, like, an authentic, dirty-sounding thing. But with do rights, our backgrounds are so different that we wind up combining things that people don't normally combine in funk. So Pablo, mm -hmm. he, he's the guitarist for the Tom Tom Club. So he has a pop rock background and he's from Argentina. So he has the Latin background. And then I came from hip hop and jazz and funk and all that stuff. So we have all these different influences um, and our sound kind of takes on this crazy melting pot of different kinds of, of musical styles and um like we'll release a single where you know like the a side you know the drums sound like a 60s type of vibe and then the b side will sound like an 80s thing rather than trying to make the single sound authentic like it was released because that's what people try to do like we're going to get a 1966 booker t and the mgs kind of a sound so we're going to aim for that on both sides like we'll have something that sounds like 1981 on one side and something that sounds like 1969 on the other like we don't really follow the rules and all the tropes that come with funk so you know for this album i mean just because of the pandemic and everything that's going on um it took its own <laughs> it took its life kind of shapes your music you know what i'm saying like whatever's going on it's gonna fall into your music whether you want it to or not like even like the chord progressions and the way things are is just darker than the other records just by virtue of everything that was going on when the record was made. So, you know, and, and I wanted to talk to you, you know, about that, about putting out music during the pandemic and, and how, you know, you had to go to plan B, C, and then who knows whatever else, you know, went to that because, you know, coming out of uh, 2019, right, you were real pumped to kind of get on the tour circuit and get out there and then, you know, life really happened. Um, how did you kind of make that adjustment? Because you talk about that that's kind of evident in the music right about now. Well, we were supposed to get on the road. We were always a studio outfit. I always say we were the funk Steely Dan. <laughs> it's like there's two of us. We both play multiple instruments through the use of multi-tracking and technology. We just play everything ourselves. So we released three albums before we even did our first show. And then we started getting booking inquiries. So then we brought on Bill Harvey, who plays bass, and Bruce Martin, who plays percussion and keys. So we started doing shows in 2019. And we got good shows, not like bar stuff. Like we played Symphony Space, uh, Uptown Manhattan, dope, dope, prestigious spot. There was a New Year's gig. And then on January 3rd, we opened up for the Scatterlights at Brooklyn Bowl. Like the Scatterlights are legends. No joke. Mm -hmm crowd loved us like we opened they didn't really know who we were and we won the crowd over everything we had a great show great venue and things were looking up they, we were looking to do a festival in the spring overseas we had a lot of things lined up that pandemic hit and it's like okay i guess we're gonna do what we always do 
make an album in the studio. So that's what we normally do is make albums. Like we were in a road group. We were trying to become a road group and then COVID hit. So then we just went, it wasn't hard for us to make an album as business as usual. What was hard was just the fact that the music was gonna change just based on what was going on in the, in the world. Um, it just took a much darker turn. Uh, right. You and, and the challenge of putting out music no, we had the social unrest. We had the, the George Floyd stuff, Rihanna. Te I mean, things were going on alongside the pandemic. So there was a lot of echoing amongst musicians, like, I guess, a guilt about putting out music during such a turbulent time. And it's like, it almost seemed like you're just narcissism. Like, well, I got a new record and I'm going to promote it. But people are getting, you know, murdered in the street, cops, and everything's going crazy. They got the protests. Like, does it even really feel right to, to, to put out music and say, hey, I got new music? Like, it's, it's self-aggrandizing. But then if you look back through history, look at everything that happened in 1968. You know, MLK assassination. You had, the, you had a lot of the same things going on at, at the end of the 60s. And you had all these groups right. releasing music that was one of the greatest years for time periods for music from 67 to 70. You had so much social unrest. We, they weren't dealing with a pandemic, but you had the Vietnam War. You see what I'm saying? So right. you had all sure. of these social, political, you know, racial things going on. And some of the greatest music of our time came out during these turbulent times. Then after that, you had Watergate. And then people wanted to escape. So that's when disco started coming around because people wanted to go to clubs and dance you know, to get their mind off of corruption that was going on in the government. So we looked at history. We were like, no, like we shouldn't feel guilty about releasing music. Like this is, if no, this, not is what you do, this is what you do. It's not like I feel guilty about going to the Hamptons for my 40th and posting it on IG. <laughs> you know, it, this is like, this is what we do. And music actually helps people. You know, people of course, home, so much it, of it's, us. A, it's a relief. You know, you know? Yeah. So um, people are on their phones all the time. So then, you know, I found that it had the opposite effect. Like people became more engaged with the music because they, they needed that. You, you get bombarded on social media constantly with just. Oh, it was tremendous. During that time. Yeah, it's just one thing after the other, and it makes you tired. You get social media tired. You get on your feed, and you're just like, yo, I want to unplug. And then somebody comes on suddenly, and it's like, you know, just somebody playing a guitar, somebody singing, or a DJ just cutting up in the bedroom, or a drummer taking a solo, or whatever. And all of a sudden, it's like, whew, I needed that. <laughs> so I know I felt that, so I was like, well, people might feel that. So Pablo and I just kept going and like, you know, the times fed into the music, but it didn't stop us from making music. We just kept pushing forward, you know? Right. And you, know, you talked about like, there's a little bit of a change in the sound and it's reflective of the times, but like, you know, over the course of the five albums, how would you say that you progressed as an individual and as a group? Well, as a group, the first album like Pablo and I were both in transition when we made the first album. I was kind of trans, like my grandmother had just passed. I was transitioning out of a hip hop career. I had a particularly disastrous South by Southwest showcase in 2016. And I was just like, I'm done. I, I'm, I can't do this anymore. And we had been doing do right stuff as a hobby since 2013. Mm. We would get together on the holidays and jam because I don't really have a lot of family around. I don't do the holidays. And at the time, my grandmother had dementia. Like, she didn't know Christmas, Thanksgiving. She didn't know what. And Pablo is from Argentina. So he didn't have no family here. So Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter, Passover, whatever. He's like, yo, it's holidays. You know what time it is. And he would come through, and we would jam all day. And that's how we got that first album together. And, you know, so I was going through this whole thing where I just... I just totally lost all passion and all interest in my hip hop career. After that South by Southwest, my grandmother died. I was just like, I need to do something else because this ain't working. And Pablo 
was doing real well touring with Tom Tom Club. Tom Tom Club is a famous pop act. So he was touring 2012, 13, 14. Things were good. But Chris France and Tina Weymouth, like, they're good for life. So if they don't want to tour, they don't have to tour. So they stopped doing shows. And then he, he's like, suddenly, he's like, yo, Tom Tom came to an do rice thing we've been doing. Why don't we put that out and see what happens? No, it was a sign. And then, you know, we put the record together. And then as the record started to come together, we started to glue it. But we were like, yo, no, let's, let's try to uh, take this to the next level. And so the first album has a lot of, of that pop, Tom Tom Club, and the hip hop influence on it. Mm -hmm. This part's where he looped up my drum laid on top like it wasn't really a funk it was funk but, but it was funk with a lot of other influences very lo-fi very you know it, it had a lot of beat call. and when we moved on to greasy listen and we decided to be a straight up funk act like we're gonna, you know we're gonna just focus on funk except that was greasy listening then gamma ray jones was like my Top show, the you know the the detective show, cinematic funk. A lot, a lot of grom at that album. Five O, or you watch the theme, the Barney Miller, that funky boom. Yeah, so it, it was a check album. We did a live album. So um, um, every album was, was different, and this one is kind of just like totally different from all, all of them because this was, this was the first time where we couldn't sit down and jam together. This whole album, with the exception of three songs, the whole album was done through We Transfer. So I, I would cut a drum track, send it to him through We Transfer. He would cut a riff, send it back. Like we've worked that way before human when you're made through file when they're made through file sharing. So that's a good question. Sending things back and forth. You know, he got sick for a minute. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was just it was it was in the street. You go to Manhattan, nobody. And it was it was just that does something to your psyche. You know what I mean? Like when you're making music, like your music just gets darker by nature. So if, if you listen to, to like Jerry Curl and Do Vibrations, that was the single we made in January that came to lighthearted, funky, low state. Just because of the circumstances is going to be different than the other ones, you know? Yeah, man. I don't have these problems with the landline, bro. <laughs> right? I know what you're saying. I think that's how I'm going to do this straight to the computer, man. I don't know if this is Spectrum or IG or what. Yo, it might be Spectrum, man. But, yeah, I, you know, when we left off, you know, we saw uh, Lord Finesse, and you talked a little bit about doing, you know, that record and, and how that was, you know, a really big, you know, thing for you this year to have your name, you know, attached to, you know, those series of remixes. And you, you posted a lot about doing it when, you know, you were in the process of it. But uh, this album that you have out now, you put out completely by yourself. Um, can you speak about some of the challenges of being a solo entrepreneur? I mean, you know, you've been doing this for more than 20 years by yourself. Yeah, well, I have, I, I'm used to pressing 45s. I've done CDs. I've done cassettes. I haven't pressed a vinyl LP since the year 2000, maybe a bottle of what? Vinyl is expensive, man. It's not cheap. Like 12 inch vinyl. It's, it's, it's an investment, man. Um, but I think that, you know, Redef Records, shout out to them. They really helped do rights get started. And we were able to get a presence with the distributors and stuff like that for the first four albums. And they gave us a nice launching pad to be able to 
do this on our own. So uh, mm. um, I was confident that we could do it. You know, you know, it's hard enough to make money with, at, with music nowadays. And so we're lucky to have an audience that appreciates, you know, so we capitalize. Work, man, like I'd be up here with the tape gun in the boxes. My, my whole office behind and this computer is just nothing but boxes and tape guns. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so, you know, packing supplies, shipping. For being an independent artist, television, licensing, sync, that's what the money is. You know, so you have to be able business savvy to get your music put in places where it can be. You know, obviously there's live performance aspect of it. Um, but, you know, the, the, the need to invest in this stuff and you put it in and you hope you break even. As soon as you break even, and you're like, Phew. And then from there, it's, it's a profit thing. So, right. And, and you know, I, I can appreciate that, right? And like that whole, like, of, let, let's get yeah, to even. And Wong, I see you in there. He knows a thing, too, about a thing or two. to the post office, <laughs> office ship and things um so that, that's a that's a huge part of it man yeah definitely and I, I just want to make sure we're on this we're on the same spot because again as some people notice you know the system, the, the, the universe is lagging a little bit here, yep. you know, that, that 10 miles again. apart. <laughs> <laughs> we get a prayer connection over a phone call in this, but yeah. Um, but, you know, those are the challenges. I think a lot of people maybe don't, don't realize it because they see the music come out and they see, the, but they don't see everything that goes into it. Um, Jay, you still with us? Yes, sir. I wonder if I. All right, you're still there, but <laughs> my mobile internet. I don't know if it's mine or yours. Yeah, or if it's just Instagram. All right, I I I see you and I hear you. Um, but this thing is not catching catching my order. Try it. Right. Try this. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot All right. of boring grunt work. I like. To yeah. Um. You know. Uh. And a lot of trips to the post office, but yeah, you'll never see me complaining. I'm used to doing. Yeah, I'm here. Yo, we're going to bounce Jay's own back in in one second. So uh, if, if Jay can come back in, we'll get it. But everyone, thank you for staying tuned. Um, again, we're trying to deal with the matrix and, and you know, where everything is, is going. So once we get him back in, again, if, if you don't know, we're talking about Jay Zone's uh, new album. It is called uh, A Funky Bad Time. And you can go to his um his his website, you can go to his band camp and uh you know and, and check that out. Um uh and you know it's a really good purchase uh you know if you want to uh you know to to pick that up. So you know go in and check out uh Jay's album. Uh it is called A Funky Bad Time. And you know we are gonna if we're gonna get this right so we can we can you know get this off because we got a few more things I think that we wanted to um you know to get to get into so stick with us. Um because we're working it all out. But all right, yeah, now Jay. I went off the Wi-Fi and I'm using my cellular data. <laughs> so maybe it's yo. Spectrum. And it bullshit. <laughs> yo, it's almost like, yo, I got to make this call after 9 o'clock so I don't use the minutes. <laughs> you know me, man. I was big on that. 
<laughs> yeah, Petey Cologne. My man Petey Cologne is uh, on, on the call. Petey Cologne, we go back to uh, WNYU, my man from Middle Village. Petey Cologne, what is up, my brother, man? Uh, he's had me up on his show many times when, you know, it used to be DJ Primetime over here. But, yeah, peace, my my brother. Hope that you are doing well. Um, Jay, let's go back to that here just a little bit. Um, Jay, you made a huge pivot with your career, uh, you know, to come over to the drumming side. And, you know, you, you kind of stepped away from from doing hip-hop and production and, and, and being an MC to do this. And you did it in your mid-30s and, you know, self-taught and, and you know, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. What was that like for you to make that pivot at that time of your career with like all the uncertainty going on? Uh, you ever see Wile E. Coyote, the cartoon? Yeah. You know when Wile E. Coyote goes off a cliff when he's chasing the roadrunner and he's like, oh shit, and there's like a cliff on, he didn't go far enough to get to this cliff, but he's already off this cliff and it's like a 50 foot drop or whatever it is. That's what it was like. <laughs> no, because it's like, um, it's scary. It's a, it's a lonely, uh, it's, it's a lonely ride, man, because basically like one thing I always say to people who want to kind of try, move into another career or like make a pivot into whether it's music or whatever, any accolades, any status, any kind of notoriety that you have from your prior career, mm -hmm. gone. You can't, you can't lean on that moving forward. And that's the most, the, that like you might, I put in like, I don't know, 20 years doing hip hop or whatever it was. That doesn't, Pimps Don't Pay Taxes doesn't save me on a gig. They're relying on me to play the drums and, and hold down the band. If I don't, I'm out of a job. You know, so it's like, it was kind of a no man's land for a long time. And it was scary because I invested a lot of money and a lot of time into this. But ultimately, I'm a nerd, man. So when I become passionate about something, I could spend six, seven hours a day doing it. And then I just don't want to do nothing else. So like, you know, when I'm not passionate about something, it's a mess. Like, I'm just miserable. And I'm not mm. the guy. Want to have around like like when I used to do DJ gigs. I know. <laughs> 40, yeah, dog. Like I was just a bastard. And then like when I at the end when I was doing rap shows, I would purposely alienate the crowd. I didn't care. Like I, you know how it is. You have to do like your quote unquote hits. I would only do the new album and then go home. Like that's how much I did. Yeah. You don't want to get that to that point. But with drums, I had there was an innocence that to it. Um, having to start over like you're ten but you're 35, will scare the shit out of you. And it'll make you practice six hours a day. Well, I was going to say, did that, did that drive you? Because a lot of people talk about that, where, like, you said, all right, you know, I had, there was nothing else. Like, I had to go and, and do this. Because a lot of people try to switch things up, and it's, like, half-assed, right? But, but you went in with both feet. Um, how did that motivate you to just be like, I really need to get good at this because I'm not turning around and going because back to the I knew I couldn't form. go back. I knew the hip hop career was over. I knew the nine to five thing didn't work. You saw the, the kind of jobs I had. <laughs> they were dead end. So it was like, I started playing drums just to get some passion for music back. Because like I was so miserable, like I was so bitter about music after the book came out that my father was like, look, I'm tired of you being miserable and curmudgeonly, like you're a musician. So find some way to, you don't have to be a rapper producer, you don't have to DJ, but find something. And I started as a bass player. I was a funk bass player in grade school. That's what, yeah, that's where I found my love for music. So I started drumming because that was kind of similar to that. And for the first six months, it was just, just a safe haven for me to enjoy music with no pressure to make money no pressure to mm -hmm. be good. But then when I realized how much I loved it and I realized I couldn't go back to what I was doing, I realized I wasn't going to write another book. I wasn't going to do hip hop anymore. I Just something went off. I was like, I like this shit enough to spend seven hours a day practicing. You Yo, know, you have to, like you, you have, have to, to love it. There's, there's no way around, but I knew that because I was a producer. Before that I was a bass player. So I had, an, I wrote a book 
So I know what it's like to just dump an entire day into something and you still suck. And then a year later, you still suck. And then two years later, you're like, wait a minute, I don't suck anymore. <laughs> and by year three, you're like, all right, I'm not that bad. I could tolerate. By year five, you're like, yo, I'm listening to myself. And I'm like, yeah. Yo, and, and you know what? A lot of people don't understand that. They, they think it's going to happen right away, and it doesn't. When I look at my writing from like 10 plus years ago, I cringe. And then as time went on, it got better, and, right, and then things started to step up. You know, as I stepped on my writing, I mean, the same thing with the DJing. I can't listen to tapes from 98, 99. Like, you they're can. rough. But plus five years and then plus five years again, right, everything got better because you learn, you know, different tips and techniques and refined stuff. And, and it's the same thing with the drumming. It, it's very rare that someone's going to be like six months in and be a prodigy. Right. And my, I always say if you could do something for five, six, seven hours a day, suck and still want to get up and do it tomorrow, then you're on to something. Right. And because, I tell my because, athletes that the same thing as well. Yeah. The, 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 you know, and one thing I wanted to make sure of when I got into the drumming, because you're a DJ, so you know this. How many times have you seen a celebrity become a DJ when their movies dry up or a rapper? How much time do you have? <laughs> right? We've all seen that. That's what I'm talking about. Celebrity sure. DJ, you know, somebody might be a rapper or producer, then they want to start. DJ and, and they never put in the crap, the, the work like that. You know, like, it, it shows, you know what I'm saying? Like, you, you know that. So I knew that when I was going into drumming, anything I accomplished in my hip hop career didn't mean shit. Now, the, the experiences of the hip hop career helped. My ear helped, being a producer helped. I know what, you know, drums are supposed to sound a certain way. I had the ear from being a producer mm -hmm. to know what good drums sound like. That gave me an advantage other drummers didn't have. But, oh, pimps don't pay taxes. That was my shit in high school. That ain't got nothing to do with me on this, this audition. If I, don't, if I flunk this audition, I'm out of a job. Yeah. <laughs> I, I went on my first audition in 2016. Nobody knew about no fucking rap records. <laughs> they, they, you're the drummer? OK, let's see what you got. And, and then I, I, he gave me, Ben Parani, he gave me the show, his last show he did. He gave me a SoundCloud. I studied the SoundCloud for three days, <laughs> learned the tunes, the arrangement, went in, did the audition, and got the audition. So it had nothing to do. Everything I did, the book, the rap shit, I did a beat for this guy in 2002, none of that shit matters. What matters was, can you deliver in the audition for what you came to do? And that's the number one thing because now we're in the era of people being, you know, multi, uh, what, what is it, uh, gig economy, where you do five, six, seven, eight different things. To now, Jake, you, you, you did that, right? Like, and, 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 and so, you know, again, what people don't know or, you know, don't know what we're talking is, right? Like, look, Jay and I have been close friends for going on, we're getting close to 20 years of knowing each other really well. Yeah. And I was with you alongside you really through all of this. And, yeah. um, you know, I knew it when you were running from, from gig to gig to record to covering basketball games to writing articles to, you know, to doing DJ gigs and then still making your own records, um, you know, your energy was all over the place. And I know that once you were able to drop stuff and focus, right, that's when the, like, the levels started coming. But, you know, you often said, like, I, I could no longer be a jack of all trades. You can't. You, you tried. You tried it. I tried. And it, did, it didn't work out. And then I realized when I started dropping stuff in 2016, you know, I stopped rapping, stopped making beats. I had a DJ gig that paid real well, but then I got canned. <laughs> and then I was all stressed out, like, man, I'm losing all this money. You know, that, that gig, mm -hmm. it was pretty, it was a corporate gig. It paid well. And then I, after a weekend of being stressed, I said, you know what? That's exactly what needed to happen to you. Because I think it, that, that has to happen to a lot of people, right? Like you, you, you need to be made uncomfortable again. All of us made uncomfortable again. And it's like there was a ceiling on DJing because I wasn't willing to put in the time to learn different records, different genres to get me more gigs, to make me more money. You have to expand. Mm -hmm. you know? And only if you're fully invested in your craft schemes. <laughs> crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but only if you're fully invested, like once I dropped all that, 
I was able to put more time into the drumming. And then all of a sudden I started getting more drumming work because the work showed off. You know what I mean? So it's like, I stopped doing everything except drumming and the do rights and playing in the bands I was in and composing music for television. And right. that and, was it. And, and when and I did that, built. it was scary because I lost all these other revenue sources, you know, a, do a beat for this guy for a cash grab or release a rap record I don't care about, do that, or write a blog article for this website. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a couple of hundred dollars here, a little money here, a little money there, you know, you're used to having that money, then it's not there. But then all that extra time you now have to put into mastering your craft. And then all of a sudden the phone starts ringing for what you're putting the time into. So that was, you know, that was huge, you know. Um, and then it's like you go through a whole thing where you lose fans. You know what I mean? Like. But, you know, and fans are, fans are they're, they're seasonal, and I don't even mean that to, to knock on, on the fans, right? Because, you no, know. No, no, ones, no, not at all. Because, right, because, because, right, they kept, they kept, they kept you afloat, and even someone who put out, like, a little bit of product myself, right? Like, I was always appreciative when, you know, folks would buy my mixed CDs and things like that, and, and you know, the, for you, right, like, some stayed with you the whole route, some came and left, and, but what they wanted out of you now, you couldn't give to them because you were in a different place and like the more that we talk i understand like there's you just can't recreate like what it was 10 years ago 15 years ago 20 years ago because we are in different places and we see some of the listeners that are saying hey i need this album this album we should we do this again that was that snapshot in time that we can't we can't get back right because we were in completely different places in our lives right Exactly. So like, it's, it's nostalgia, you know what I'm saying? Like musical careers are like train routes, like people get on and off and very few people are there from the first stop to the last stop. Mm -hmm. Very few people ride the train from Mott Avenue, Far Rockaway to the top of the A uptown. People right. take off along the way and they get where they're going. And you, I, I never took that, you can't take that personally. You know, so that's another thing. If you're going to make a career change, you can't depend on people who who were supporting you for one thing to still be there that's part of it that's part of the growing pain right mm -hmm. but i'm saying that it's the wiley e. coyote thing you're off the cliff like you're in this no man's land like you're not quite where you want to be but you jump too far off the cliff to go back to where you came from so it's unnerving because you're looking at 100 feet below you you're about to drop but then somewhere along the way you got to find a you got to doggy paddle your way to the other side, you know, like right. that, that's kind of the mentality that you have to have. If, if you're going to, if you're going to make a career change later in life, that's something that you have to keep in mind. You know, and, and you did this without uh, a backer without like, um, you know, it's not like you had a massive fund, a trust fund, right? Like, so don't get it twisted. Like, you know, you weren't like a trust fund kid. Cause we, we ran into a lot of those in hip hop, right. That were like doing, you know, their work with like their parents' money and their seed money, like you had none of this, which, you know, makes it like even, you know, more impressive. It's like, yeah, I went and made this switch, like all on my own, my own salary, my own savings, you know, and then picking up little things just to keep the lights on. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. how scary that is. But you you know, now that you're on the other side, right, a lot of people that are listening are coming from your side tonight. Um hopefully you can see it. And if you haven't like uh, gotten to the new album, I really encourage you to go to uh, pick it up uh, a funky bad time. You can go to your uh, band camp page, which, you know, uh, I know where you like to send people. And actually speaking of the band camp page, can you tell the listeners how important it is for an artist that fans buy direct? I know it's good to buy from other stores. So it shows that you have a following, but how much of an impact that it really has that if they're going to, you know, pick up some music or they want to stream stuff that actually they're better off than spending a few bucks going to your band camp and buying some downloads or buying the album. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a pain in the butt. A lot of people, Spotify is convenient, you know, going to the record stores. But the, the issue everybody has with buying the record is shipping. Because yeah. if you're going to buy a record, the, the shipping costs more than the record. To send one of these to Europe, it costs more than the actual record. So to all my people in Europe that bought it, you know, thank you. But, but my thing is volume. 
like we've been putting out do right records for so long when you come buy something for one price you can get all the stuff so our goal is to cut out all the you know all the stores and just do everything direct that's like where you're gonna you're gonna go to a record store now like the it's already hard for record stores. A lot of record stores are closing. So, right, and they could just go right to your site and, and, and pick all that up. That's all part of, like, wheel, you got to wield the tape gun. You got to be good with getting your licensing done. You got I'm sitting up here learning iMovie. I got to put together drumming videos and little shorts that, you, like, this is all part of it. Like, you can't, that's what I was saying, why being a jack of all trades is useless. Because mm. even if you have one trade, you have to learn five other skills, soft skills, just to get that one trade visible. Like you got to learn mm -hmm. how to use iMovie. You got to learn how to do digital distribution. You got to learn how to like, you know, use social media to your advantage. You got to like study these things. And that takes time out of your day. And so you're doing you this all by your, yourself. Right. I mean, well, Pablo helps, you know, with, with Do-Right. Right. But I'm saying, like, the, the general management of stuff. Like, yeah. again, you're looking at someone here who is, Jay's, you know, Jay Live had a line in one of his songs. But, yeah, you're like, the, you're like the executive vice president of, like, marketing, promotion, distribution, <laughs> recording, <laughs> keep going, <laughs> finance. Yeah, but you can leave it up to somebody else and lose half the money. Or not, right. know what, or not know what's making what. So this is all part, like, a lot of people just don't want, they just want to make music. And, you know, back in the days, you just had to have a good lawyer, and then you had to hire people to watch the people that you're watching. <laughs> but now, it's like, you can do everything yourself, but then you have to learn all these other skills just to promote your music and just to get it to where it needs to be. That takes mm -hmm. hours hours and hours and hours a day to, to you know to, to focus on this kind of stuff and then when that's done now you got to work on your music so now I have one or two crafts instead of seven like imagine I was doing all that for years imagine doing that and I got a DJ tonight but I want to practice drums but then somebody wants a beat and I don't feel like doing it but they already gave me half the deposit somebody wants a verse for this somebody wants an article for, I got to write an article for medium mm -hmm. Disney, then everything winds up being half-ass. Like the quality starts to taper because you just don't have the time to invest to make things to really put it right. in. Right, right, and and, then, and and still and still be yourself, right, and still take care right. of your other if, right if pursuits. Look at years past. Look at but look look at somebody like if you want to talk drumming, look at a master of Buddy Rich, Elvin Jones, Bernard Purdy, John Bonham. Take your pick. All they did was play drums. Mm -hmm. that's why they're so freaking good <laughs> because they didn't have to do all this other stuff right but a lot of those musicians didn't make the money they were supposed to make but now the music business is set up so that you can be self-sufficient but being self-sufficient takes a, it's a job it's part of your right job. there's another there's another cost so you know it, it always right. comes back to the job ain't nothing but work but it, it's work son it's, it's work it's a job so you have to look at it like you're nine to five. Like, okay, I gotta mail this. I gotta go to MailChimp and do an email. I gotta do mm -hmm. social media. Then I gotta go edit a bunch of video footage. Like those little drumming clips I put on Instagram, those have directly led to work. <laughs> like I've posted videos and somebody's go, man, I got a record uh, I need you to play on. What's the deal? And then I've gotten work. So that's part of my job. That's part of how I make a living is studio drumming. So I have to make good quality videos and I'll film it. And then now I'm doing things with the sound. And, you know, I didn't know how to use iMovie. I'm clumsy with that kind of shit. But I had to learn. I had no choice. Right. So, and, and all this stuff is, is born out of that. Yeah. Back in the days, musicians didn't have to do that. All they had to do was play. But now you're hearing stories like, yo, they're 80 years old with all these hit records and nothing to show. Well, think, think about when you first came into the industry, right? You had to do very little of this. And, you know, when we used to talk, right, like, you you even said you know you stayed off of a lot of social media like you'd lurk but you didn't participate N now yeah. you have to fully participate and record your own like we didn't have the tech to like record our own videos if we did it was so like um primitive right yeah. that like it looked terrible and but now that the stuff is ubiquitous like you have to do it like that's part of that's being part an of artist job. you can't pass on that stuff it's part of your job 
you know, like if you're, you know, I don't know, like I'm good friends with Danger Mouse. Like he doesn't do a whole lot of yeah. social media, you know what I mean? But it's like he's also produced records for the gorillas and he, he's gotten to a certain level, you know, but it's like for the average working blue collar musician, this is part of your job. You know, and it, yeah. it's a job. I think people don't realize that just because something's your passion and your craft, that it, it's also a job. And any job is going to have things you like and things you don't like. You're a teacher. You're a coach. There's things you like. There's things you don't like. There's a lot of and stuff I don't like right about now, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so people think they're going to get into music and they're going to just do what they do all day and that's and what they like is going to be what they do all day like there's going to be shit no it's not it, it would it would be lovely if it's that way but it's not yeah so um it's not that way so with all of these with the new model of the music business with all of these things that you have to do just to ensure that your art is put out there properly mm -hmm. that takes up so much of the day that when you're done with that when I'm done with all that shit, I just want to go beat up on some drums and then work on my craft. So there's no room to do all these things, you know, to take a DJ gig, to make a beat, to do a, write an article about something for Medium or whatever. There's no room for that. Yeah. It, you know, it, it, Jay, speak, speaking of writing, because I, I got this in my hands, right? Um, oh, wow. I still, I still think it's worth talking about in a, in a short way because... You know, for some people that came on to to you uh, only as as drumming, this was part of the the exit strategy. Uh, you know, I think right with with the music, which it was cathartic. Uh, but I also think this is a landmark book because this is probably one of the only ones written about the experience of being an independent hip hop artist. You know, during that two thousands era, and there's a lot of stuff that, uh, you know, people don't realize that go into, which you talked about a bit today, but what was this process like writing, uh, for you writing this book? And, you know, now that you've had time to, like, reflect on it, what do you think it, it represents? And folks should go get Well, that book, I wrote it and not It's like we're having trouble again. You there? Yeah, I got you back. So um, I, we were talking about the book, Jay, Root for the Villain, like where, you know, where that stands for you. I wrote the book in 2010 when I was sure. at Wine Dance Memorial High School on Long Island. Um, for those who don't know Wine Dance, that's where Rock Kim is from. Mm -hmm. It's a small town on Long Island. They have, you know, there's some socioeconomic issues, but it's a small community. And my, my boss in the office I worked in was actually Rakim's seventh grade math teacher, mm -hmm. Steve Berger. So I worked with Mr. Berger. We used to talk about Rakim as a kid. It was, you know, it was, that was a cool part of the job. But I remember I used to, it's a high school. So when I would walk around the school, I would hear kids talking about like, man, I'm going to be a rapper. And then I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to get me a Benz. I get out of here and I'm going to be rich and I'm going to leave the hood. And I'm like, they really think that that's what being a rap artist, a hip hop artist is like, like a lot of kids really believe that. Yeah. And at the time I was feeling bitter about the hip hop career. Like, um, I just, like towards the end of it, it just left a bad taste in my mouth. Like, you know, around 2009, I stopped entirely. And I just wanted to get a stable job and try to set myself up. You know, you know mm -hmm. when you turn 30, you panic. And you get to 40, you realize 30 is nothing. <laughs> right. Now, looking back, I'll never forget. But, you know, being 30, in early 30s, you're like, well, I, I want to make some regular money. And I'm tired. I was tired of doing the hip hop. And, I, and then I started getting ideas for the book. Like, I want to write a book from the perspective of the working musician, even not beyond hip hop, just any genre, just even what I'm doing now is the same thing. A mm -hmm. blue collar person, not somebody who started from the hood, 
had a tough childhood, became a rap star. Now they live in Calabasas, the end. Like, I, we read thousands of those fucking books. And then they yes. had some drug addiction sandwiched in between to make it juicy. And, but, like, what about somebody who got in, said, fuck this shit, and left? Because I know tons of people that happened to me. And I was like, I'm going to write a book just from that perspective of doing things on the blue collar level and teetering that line between having to go get a job or do I continue? And um, just hearing the kids talk about becoming rap stars and shit like that and, and my own internal turmoil of just the hip hop career ending and I wasn't quite at peace with it. The book was my, enabled me to bring the two together. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like to bring the two worlds together, to, to close out that chapter but you can't, if you're bitter about something, it'll bother you forever. You got to close it out. So the book would be a nice way to close out the hip hop career. And it'll also be a way to give people a look in, into this world that most people don't know exists. You know, they don't, they might know about a rap star. They might know about 50 Cent or they might know about somebody in front of Fat Beat selling the CD like, yo, you like real hip hop fam? <laughs> like, they, they get bothered on the way to the store with that shit. So they know about that, but they don't know there's a middle ground where you're actually surviving on this, but all it takes is one bad tour or one poorly received record, and you're back on, you're back on LinkedIn looking for a job. So right. that's unnerving because you want to stay true to your art, but the, you know, it's, it's, it's a unique experience that hasn't been covered too much in music by, uh, autobiographies and biographies. So, I wanted to show that and I wanted to do it with humor because there was some heavy shit in there. But at the same time, I was able to laugh at it because I closed the chapter. I was like, I ain't going back to that. So it's all good. I was able to process mm -hmm. it and move on. And the book came out October 3rd, 2011. And I got my first drum set October 5th, 2011. Two days Yo, so you really said it was a transition. It really was. It really was. That first week in October of 2011 was the, probably one of the most important weeks of my life because one chapter ended and another one began in a matter of three days. You know, um, so that's what the, the book is kind of like the, I call it the halftime show of my career so far. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, it, it's, it's kind of the glue that, the bridge between one side and the other. Um, and it enabled me to move forward. That was the most valuable thing about that book to me. I was able to close a chapter, be proud of it, own it, but then start from zero. And in 2012, when the book died down, that's when the seven hour practice day started. Started. <laughs> you know. You know if, if folks want to get their hands on the book, where would you direct them? Amazon, because they cut me out. <laughs> It was. It wound up being too much to ship it, man. Um, so, and, and you know, I'm I'm like that, man. I just keep moving forward. Like I, I kept it in stock for almost ten years. Yeah. Just recently, I got caught out there. I didn't update the shipping on the book for international, and then I lost. Like I remember, I made eighty two cents on the book, and I was like, oh, "Hey, got <laughs> just, just get it from Amazon, and I'll get paid at the end of the month." You know. So. Um, so yeah, man, it, it was, um, but it was, it was, it was important, man. I wouldn't have been able to get into what I'm into now without writing that book. That's for sure. Definitely. Right. Yeah. I got a question that's up on screen cause I'm still trying to handle this. I'm trying to get it off, but, um, it's saying, how do you charge for your work? Is it hourly per song? I guess without giving that stuff away, uh, Jay directly, um, Talk about pricing your work in general, because I know that's something that artists often deal with is like they struggle with, you know, how do you price your work and, and how have you been able to build a standard for yourself? Well, Blueprint has a really good podcast about this stuff. Super Duty mm -hmm. Tough Work. Check that out. Yo, yeah, go listen to it, folks. It's really, really good podcast. It's I listen like to a everybody. real music business game on that, on that podcast. But, yeah. to, you know, pricing your work is tricky. Um, you have to figure out the demand and then you have to figure out the budget. Like not everybody's going to have the same budget, but you, you try to build the happy medium. And then I also look at what it's going to do for my career as, as a drummer. Like that's, that's part of it. So there's a lot of factors that weigh into it. Um, it's still a work in progress. 
you know, I took some L's early on <laughs> because right. it, was such a, it was such a niche area, like studio drumming, but you're not technically playing studio session drums in a traditional sense where you and five other guys are getting scaled to come in and learn an arrangement. Like you're getting Pro Tools files and stems and then you got to create parts. Sometimes is it like four bars that you're going to loop and make a beat out of or do I have to play a whole arrangement and follow mm -hmm. all the chord changes? Those are two different ways of laying down a song, right? So it depends on if it's like, yo, I want an original drum break that no one else got or it's like, yo, I have a five minute song that has all these, you know, there's an arrangement. You have to follow it and play it from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. That's that's two different things. It's the, the kind of work I do is so broad that it varies. And I had to go through each situation and kind of figure it out. So it's a trial and error thing. I know people don't like to hear about trial and error, but that's the reality of anything related to music. There's no guarantees. There's no set way of doing things. You have to fall on your face to really learn what works and what doesn't work. And people don't like to be uncomfortable. You know, they, that's unnerving to people. Like, yo, I got to fuck up and fail <laughs> to figure out, like, you know what it's like to get punched in the face. So you do whatever it takes to not get punched in the face again. It's the same thing right. when you're growing up and getting picked on, right? So it's the same thing. You know, you, you kind of have to learn through just um, making mistakes and and but you no, know, but always you know you demand what you can for your work, but then without pricing yourself out, and and then it's it's and that, that's always the hardest thing, right? Is finding where that line is, right? You know, you don't want to like scare people away, but you want to get what your what your work is. And I've done everything from like a producer who needs a breakbeat to you know records for Karen O, Danger Mouse, Broken Bells. Mm -hmm. You know, I've I've done it all around the spectrum. Um, so it's it's just it's it's there's an art to it. I'll say that. Um, yeah, definitely. And and you know, I guess so long you, you've done it right, you, you kind of figure out a better way around it. You know, we know our, our brother Scheme Richards is still tuned in. I had a lengthy talk with Scheme for my Forbes column last night, and it should run sometime tomorrow uh, about breakdancing uh -huh. being added to the 2024 Olympics. You know, as someone who makes funk music and is really still attuned to, you know the heartbeat of break dancing. Uh, what do you think about break dancing being added to the Olympics? I never really processed it yet. Like I saw yeah. it, when, you know, you're scrolling and you see things. I haven't even processed, processed it to have an opinion yet. Dead honest, like, like yo, I haven't even really thought about it, man. If they want to hire me to play the drums, then let's go. <laughs> There we go. That was that was, that was part of the talk because you know they're probably gonna have to uh, you know recreate a lot of those beats instead of licensing them. So I've done that right? before. I've done drums for b-boy stuff. Shout out to Lean Rock. He got me some work doing that like about five, five years ago. So um, I guess if I could play the drums, then let's uh, let's get the Olympics. Going yeah, on. definitely. Yo, we really appreciate everyone that's tuning in. We got a few few more minutes. My good brother, uh, Jay Zone. And again, you know, you folks don't have his uh, new album, The Do Rights. Uh, it's called A Funky uh, Bad Time. Uh, you can search that up on, on the Internet. But, you know, if you can go direct to the source, um, I really always think that is the uh, best way. And if the folks don't know, like I said, Jay and I have known each other through music and his friends, geez, for quite some time. We even did a mixtape uh, together way back <laughs> in the DJ primetime days. Um, and, you know, so we, we've we been around a lot um, on this and I know that people are seeing examine baseball. What does that have to do with music and, and hip hop? But, uh, you know, I, I had my feet in that world for, for quite a while. And, you know, hopefully this exposed, you know, listeners here to, to, to Jay Zone. And if you like what you're hearing, drop me a follow too. I try to mix it up, uh, you know, every now and then with a little music, music touch. And, um, you know, hopefully the writing is good for everybody, but, uh, you know, Jay, just like, what do you have on deck? You know, we're about to cross 2021. Here we were almost a year ago, you know, New Year's Eve. I was with you, you know, as you, you perform with uh, Ben Parani and, and, you know, a year kind of goes in, in a snap of the fingers. And, uh, you know, looking to 2021, what are some things that you'd like to get done, um, you know, going in, being that, you know, everything was kind of turned upside down? Well, I have some projects in the works. 
um, I did a whole I did a whole drum bundle for Showbiz from DITC mm. uh, for an album he's working on. So I did a whole bunch of custom drums for him. And we actually we're about tomorrow. I'm supposed to have a a safely distanced and masked jam session uh, with Pablo. We're starting to work on the next do rights. Yeah. It, it, Stop, man like that like in the normal world we would tour this album for what six months a year but we just keep going i mean all, all i can say is that like, you know i feel like because i started playing so late in life and you know at 35 34 35 i just it's just like a vengeance like i get up every day and it's like all right what can i improve today i got work to do you know there's never nothing to do man it's it's like right this game says it never stops. Album's already out, but this whole month I've just I redid my studio a little bit, and I've just been practicing like a madman because if things do come back in this shows or I get a call to do something, I want to be ready. And so I've just been practicing a lot. Um, would you, you know, Would you consider exploring like the like the digital platform? And some people said, "Oh, you know, you guys maybe should do like a live jam." you know, online or do something for the fans or something, you know, like this, although we've seen how the internet connection really can make this uh, interesting, you know, to it say the least. But cool that's since I went to my regular uh, mobile data, though, man. Like, I, when I yeah. got the Wi-Fi, that's when it got cool. So I yeah. might have to go down the spectrum tomorrow with a mask on and bring the old Louisville slug, you know. That's right. But, you know, yeah, would you Lord, consider doing yeah, something yeah. like that for the fans or a little jam session or recording, like, uh, you know, a few – uh, you know, a live performance of a few of these things, either live or taped, you know, in, in the crib or at the, at, you know, at the studio? Or yeah, is someone saying no. maybe possibly doing something on Twitch? Yeah, no, we're, we're thinking about that, um, a do-rights uh, show, because we worked so hard on our show. And then we performed two or three times. We did a live album, and that was it. So it's like we've been working really hard on getting that together. Then COVID hit. So it's like we have all the put in all the work. We might as well share it. So we're thinking about doing that. I, I wasn't crazy about going live. Like, what if we go live in a show and this happens? Like, what happened with us? Like, what if it freezes? Right. On <laughs> the first song, I won't know until we're done. So, like, you know, I'm a little bit wary about it. But, um, like I said, we, you got to be creative. Part of your job as, as an artist has nothing to do with your actual craft. How do you get your craft in front of people? So part of what I've been doing is just figuring out a creative way to get things out there. You know, I, I, I'll sit here like, should we do the live? Or maybe we could do this, or maybe we could do that. It's part of the job now. 25, 30 years ago, you had someone taking care of all that. But now right. that's all, if we don't come up with something, they just don't see us. They don't hear us. So yes. we, we, you know, so with do rights, like even through the pandemic, now you know we we still get together sometimes, and when we get together, we film it because we need that, <laughs> you know, to, to let people know what we're doing. Like that's the mentality of the modern artist. Um, so, but you know, we're putting that together. We're always recording new material, so that's that. I mean, I've been doing stuff with Ben Parani and those guys as well, and yeah, we're doing the best we can. Um, but there's going to, the, the music isn't going to stop, man. Like we're going to keep you know, doing stuff regardless. So, um, right. And that, that definitely stops. And I, I'm, I'm trying to toggle while you're talking here with this question to see if I can get it off, get it off the screen. But, um, you know, um, I mean, if anyone has any questions, I, I guess I could open up for a few more minutes. Jay, you've been super generous with your time, you know, as always. And, and I appreciate it. And, um, you know, it's, it's always good to, to talk to you, even though, this is, you know, not probably far off to what we normally, right, would, would talk about. But, you know, again, the people that are tuning in, I know you don't go live that often, and a lot of your fans and, you know, people are following me or, 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 you know, are catching it and, you know, having a chance to, you know, connect with you. So if you have any any questions that, you know, you want to ask, I guess we feel them for a few more minutes and, you know, and then and then wrap this up. But, again, you know, while we're here, how else can people reach out to you? Here, yes, we're on Instagram, but, you know, it, it's funny how you've, like, tailored your uh, – your handles for for each place. So where else can they catch up with you besides uh, Instagram? Because I'm sure people have their hands on other platforms. J Zone, don't tweet. Same thing, but don't tweet uh, for Twitter. Facebook is J Zone 101, J Z O N E 101. But I'm kind of wary about. I'm, I'm th I know you always get on me about Facebook and all that shit, but like 
you'd be better at it, but I'm like, ah, it's too it's lousy, man. I can't deal with it. It, it. I mean, it really has turned into like a soundboard for most people, right? Like, um, you know what I mean, we could talk. Is, it's like when Facebook first came out, it's like Joe Clark and Lean on Me when he's there in the 60s and he's teaching a class. And then Facebook now is like when he comes back in 87 and Welcome to the Jungle comes on. <laughs> he's walking through the hallway. Welcome to the Jungle. That's what it feels like every time I log in. So I actually took the app off my phone. I can only get on Facebook on a desktop. So Facebook ain't the best place to find me. But um, yeah. Instagram, Twitter. Um, what other ones? I have the website, of course. Uh, GoVillainGo.com. Websites basically are useless. Not useless, but nobody really. But, I mean, if, if anything important that needs to be seen it can be found on GoVillainGo.com. That's basically how my dad knows what I'm up to. He goes to the website. That's right. Right. As long as dad's informed and, you know, it's uh, it's all good. Peace to Mr. Mr. Mumford is enjoying the good weather. You know, my brother, yeah. DJ Chief One. Um, folks, check DJ Chief One if you're you're not uh, already following him. He does he does he goes live once a week and he kind of mixes you know some of the dope underground stuff still. And he's a quality DJ. We used to have him up on the radio show. And uh, yeah, peace to my man Chief One. Um, you know for for you know for for tuning in and um, you know being here along with us. But yeah, you know you talk about that like people are going to go to different places you know to find you and you know wherever home is uh, for folks online. Right, you want to stay up and, and stay tuned, and and I know it's the holidays. You know, money's not always long, right? But even a few dollars goes a long way. So like we talked about earlier, if you you can hit the band camp, you know, or you know, uh, make a J Zone Do Rights playlist on 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 Spotify, right? Tell a few friends, you know, that you like. All this really does go uh, a lot longer way, and and every dollar like counts in a in a, in a big way. Yeah. Yeah, man. It, 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 and, um, it's longer than what it's longer than what people think. No, and I appreciate it. we've done really well with the record, a lot better than I expected. And I just want to thank everybody who picked up the funky bad time. It's and like all the forty fives, all the records, we super, super, super appreciate it because you know people could spend money on a lot of things, and right? Growing on trees. So the fact that so many people came out and supported the record, I'm we really, really appreciate that and. Funk doesn't have a, uh, when you go on uh, iTunes or SoundCloud, like you can't even choose funk as your genre. You got to mm -hmm. choose army soul. Like when you go to Distro Kid and register an album, there's no funk choice. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it's like funk is still kind of fighting for respect as a genre. It's a small genre. So every bit of, look, I'm on a baseball show talking about funk because there's no funk right. show. <laughs> so, um, so so, I mean, I stopped following baseball after the Mets won the 86 uh, World Series. So Pick a good time. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, Dwight Good and Strawberry, all that. But I'm, I'm saying, like, that shows you that funk is a small thing. So the fact that people still, you know, support it and DJ culture, you know, producer culture, they, you know, we, we, we really were pleasantly surprised and we really appreciate people uh, checking us out. You know. Yeah. You know, we got one question from uh, one of the listeners, Oliver Cunningham, I, if I, I got that right. He says, how do you cope with too much work in too little time? Do you talk about putting all that time in? I mean, I can answer that from my side, but I think I'll let you go first. And you're probably one of the last. Too much work in too little time? Too much work and not enough time to, like, get it done, I guess. Well, I think about getting paid after. No. Uh, <laughs> but that's what I was saying earlier about the jack-of-all-trades thing. I'm able to yeah. manage it if, like, there's a lot of work to just to maintain the ship, like I was saying, shipping, creating content, so all that other crap, you know, sound exchange, getting music placed on television, pitching things for TV, like, all these different things. But narrowing my actual art down to one or two things instead of six or seven would allow me to even function. Because if I had kept yeah. doing what I doing five or six years ago, there's no way I'd be able to, like, like you would start to see the work suffer. You know, like, like, like I would, the quality of the work would tail off. Like, if I can only practice 15 minutes a day or spend 10 minutes on a beat or two minutes on a verse or spend 25 minutes to get records together, instead of spending the four hours I have on that. Then, Plus the know, travel. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Plus, oh, come on, man. In New York City, just getting. So to, to answer that question, you know, the, you can't get around having to promote and release and press up, at least with me, like pressing up records, right. shipping them. That's a daily reality. Like, I, I keep a tape gun. I got tape in the car, tape guns in the office, tape gun in the bedroom. Like, I'm always taking boxes or printing out labels and there's crap all over the place. Like, that is part of it when you're dealing with a lot of, you know, physical merch and things like that. But, sure. But narrowing my actual musical disciplines down, like, I know when it's time to work on music, I, I go sit at that drum kit or I sit at the keys and work, create a song, you know, start trying to create tunes with, with Pablo. Worry about DJ residency. You know, like every Thursday, you know, it takes two hours to get there, an hour to, you know, then you come next day, it's all messed up because you're so tired of like running. Like that was me three, four, five, six years ago. And her, that question that Oliver, that he asked is why I chose to narrow it down and try to master things. So when work does come in, you're adept enough at your skill to take any kind of job. That's, that's right. where you want to, you want to be so good. You want to be well enough in your craft where you don't have to turn down work. You know, have too much work is a good thing if the work is paying, but the, the sure. further you are on your craft, the more money you can demand and the more, the more, you know, variety and the type of work you're going to get. Right. You can, you can see what you can say yes and no to. Right. So like, exactly. so I think sometimes like early on, even like myself or like writing, if, if stuff gets thrown my way, I've learned to say no because, look, I still have my full-time teaching job. When it's normal times, right, I'm coaching, I still have to fit my column in and then whatever other side work I'm getting pitched. And at some point, I think, like, you have to weigh, like, what's the time value trade-off for it, right? And there's even stuff I'll take that's low pay or no pay sometimes if there's, like, a value trade-off or if it's an interview or, like, a live or something like that because there's other value for it. But... I also think there's like a prioritizing that we all have to do where it comes to like scheduling, like the pandemic definitely has helped me like get up early and those two hours now that I'm not commuting, like I'm using between six and eight because, you know, that's when I'm getting my, my, my meal planning out of the way for the day, all my emails responded to scheduling my social media posts, all that stuff. Right. So it's, it's done. And that opens up time later in the day or getting a workout in really early in the morning. Like, all that stuff gets time in. So I feel like if, if the listeners are struggling with like, I have, I feel like I have too much to, to do and not enough time. Like you have to prioritize and schedule and then you have to kick some stuff to the side. Yeah. I, and time management is super, super, super important. We could easily blow two, three hours just scrolling. Word. So you can and do like, that. The phone's got to, the phone's got to go away. So like, if there's something y'all got to like do, the phone's got to go away. The computer, shoot, turn the internet connection off. Because that, that distracts the heck out of me. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like all I, that like, stuff's got to go. When I sit down at the drums to practice every afternoon, I go on airplane. Yeah, we can't reach you. Yeah, I go on airplane. Put it on airplane mode. Or power it off. And then sometimes I want to film some of it. So if I need to film, I'll go on airplane. That way I can film without being distracted. But if it's not a day where I'm filming, I'll turn the phone off. Like, like anything can wait. Like even if it's an emergency, like I ain't gonna be able to get there in time. I'm down here working. So you have, don't be afraid to turn your phone off. If you got some work, turn that shit off. Like, like your phone, phones in our lives easier and made things more convenient, but a phone can also mess you up. Because like I was saying earlier, you look at all the people who came before us who were masters at what they did, they didn't have that kind of distraction. It, we have we're, we're, we have distractions at our fingertips, you know, the flicks and the phone and so you know the social media and everything is there. So um, and during the pandemic, it's actually gotten worse because you're home all day, so you're used to grabbing that thing. Right, and like I think you got to figure out. All of us have to figure out better ways to like really use that time because that's maybe we got about three minutes. That's like the blessing, I think, of all this. You know, whether it's for yourself, finding more time to get in your art or, or promote more or whatever else that, you know, people are listening that are doing, right? Like, what can we do with the extra time that actually we've been given by this pandemic, you know, to, to, make, to make a right. step forward? And, and like you said, you've done that with your music, and that's why we have a funky bit of time. 
we took advantage. Like you can you ball up. I mean, everybody's been screwed up by this. But if you're an artist and this or a musician, this is what you do. You can ball up, but eventually you gotta you gotta get on it, man. Like I used to always complain that I couldn't practice. Like because practice in the wood shedding for me, practicing is where I come up with new ideas and new mm -hmm. things. New drum sounds, new micings, new patterns, new fills, new grooves. When you're out on the road, I was on the road last year. I toured with Ben Parani. I was always out on the road, gigging, touring. So it's like you're getting better when you're when you're playing with other musicians. What really what gets your chops up? But you're not really learning that much new stuff because you're playing the same folks every night. So when got away from us, it sucks to not be able to play with other musicians. But then I'm like, that practice time you wanted, now you got it. Now you got a lot of it. It's golden. It's been golden. Like, I even look with the volleyball playing, right? I was saying to somebody else, we got about two minutes. Like, I got so much better this year because that's basically all I could do before I got hurt about a month ago, right? So yeah. whether it's taking the coaching, the lessons, being on the court four or five days a week, like, that got me through this. And I was able to get my game up another level where I didn't, probably wouldn't have if there was no pandemic because I wouldn't have had time, you know, to do it. Right. 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 And so, you know, so yeah, like I, I spent a lot of that time just because when you're out on the road, that's when it's exposed what you need to work on. Right. Like when you go on tour right. and you're playing on stage and you listen back, you listen back to that flip rushing like motherfucker when this part comes in and you want you, you try to work it out on the road. And then you know, now that I've been, I've just been putting the metronome on real slow, just like, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, you know, just real, real slow, and forcing myself to breathe. Like, that's something that you can't run just gigging all the time. Like, you have to actually go back to the drawing board. It's like you want to learn how to shoot free throws in the playoffs. It's, it's, it's a thing. We got about a minute, Jay. It's just, sports is the same way, right? Like youth sports, yeah, a lot of kids are tournament play, 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 but then they, they don't practice enough and you need to slow stuff down to get it where it was. Yo, I, I would love to keep going, but like the clock's going to cut us off in about 45 seconds. Yo, my good brother, Jay Zone, please go check his album, The Do Rights. Oh. We got a final call yeah, on that? Yeah, a funky bad time go and check that out give him give him a follow give him some love and you know if you find your hearts and wallets definitely throw some support that way jay we will talk soon and then later everyone that is uh that was watching yo peace thank you for joining us and uh yo hope we have to do this again soon with the uh, no crazy connections ever since right, I peace, went on the phone wi-fi i'm good all right y'all <laughs> yo thanks everyone for listening peace out all right all right all right